Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, go with me over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. Did anybody bring a Bible with them? <laughs> we got three people that brought a Bible. No, we, I see y'all out there. But we're going to put it on the board because I want everybody to be able to read along. How many of you all know that your answers are in God's Word? All right? God watches over His Word to perform it. Not our emotions, not our tradition, and not our need. That's how important your Bible is. It is the one offensive weapon that you have. It's called the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and it cuts the devil coming and going. And I want to read it together, verse 6 through 11, to, together today. Ready? Read. It says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous. Everybody shout generous. So that you can be generous when? On every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Would the church say amen? amen. Today's message is entitled, Activate Generosity. Say, Activate Generosity. Tell your neighbor you're in the right place today. You really are. I have a few goals for today. If you're taking notes, please write this down. Goal number one is to help us understand the importance of generosity. You know, my pastor used to always say that people would do better if they knew better. And I believe that's true most of the time. But I have met some jokers that they know what to do, but they still don't do it. But that's not us. I believe that the people live at the level that they're taught. You know, the Bible says that with all of your getting, get understanding. And it says that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge in Hosea 4, 6. It means that what you don't know is actually killing you. What you don't know about being a husband is killing your marriage. What you don't know about budgeting and uh, finances is killing your finances. And so we want to get understanding and we want to get knowledge. And I believe that if people really understood generosity, what generosity does to bless the world around you and what, how God uses generosity to change you on the inside, if you really understood that, there is no believer that would not be generous. Goal number two, write this down, is that I want to help activate generosity. And so at the end of today, I want to pray for you. And when I say activate, that is a spiritual thing. And um, I've been thinking a lot about activation lately. I taught a message a while ago called Activate Faith. I believe that um, a live conference is an activate conference. And what it means to activate, it means to make something active or operative, to start it off, to trigger it, to set it in motion. It, it, it reminds me of if you walk into a dark room and the lights are turned off and you can't see where you're going, but as soon as you flip the switch, all of a sudden there's illumination and you can see. I believe there's some gifts that God has given you that's been lying dormant on the inside of you and it's time for them to be turned on. That's what it means to activate them. That means that God has given you something and sometimes you don't get the benefit of what he's given you because it's lying dormant and we're going to turn some stuff on that's been turned off in this message. Somebody say amen. Amen. I believe this is an activation message. I believe we're in an activation season. And so goal number three that I have today is to help you understand that your generosity changes lives. Did you know that? Your generosity, it changes people's lives. Can I show you your generosity in action? A couple of weeks ago, we had some young girls that came from the UK. They flew here to be a part of a live conference, but they got stuck and uh, they were here through Milton, the hurricane. How many of you all remember that? Now, some of you all didn't see this happen, but this service, this 1030 service, y'all turned up in a generous way. But I want everybody to see what generosity does. So if you all could roll that clip very quickly. This happened two weeks ago. In the UK, when was this? Back in the spring of this year, in March. And they, I was just talking about a live conference, and these four young women said, I'm going to go to America. Was this, is this your first time in the States? You've been once, once, first time, okay? I'm gonna to go to the States and I'm gonna be a part of a live conference. And so when the hurricane was coming in, we saw it coming, but we didn't know it was gonna be that serious. And so we released the message on Monday that we needed to postpone the conference. They were already in the air. 
So they land in Orlando Monday night, 11 p.m. I get a message like, cry emoji face, cry emoji face. Oh my God, you all have postponed the conference. And then they got stuck in a hurricane for like six, seven days. They've been here since Monday. And so what I thought is that we could just be a blessing to them today. I'm examining, I'll jump up with this bucket right here. This is old school. Let me turn around and keep the bucket. You're going to be, this is the freshest dressed usher ever. Y'all remember the old school usher? This ain't it. This is a new school usher. And if you guys just, I don't know, you got something on you and you're like, I want to give $5 or $20 or pay off their tuition, just let the Lord use you. But I want you to jump up real quickly. If that's you, and, that, and I'll start it off. I, listen, I went and got some cash because my wife is hurricane paranoid, and she thinks the ATM machines are going to shut down. So she made me go get cash. I got $200 right here. And there's four of them, okay? There's four of them, so y'all got to gotta, gotta split it with your friends. But this is just going to be a little traveling change, just a little something to help you out, you know? I don't know how much it's going to be. But pray right now, it might be a lot, you know, I don't know. All these people got cash. I thought y'all just had ATM. <laughs> I thought I was gonna get a bunch of messages saying, Pastor, can we, can we give on the app? No, this is not giving on the app. They need to be able to turn this into euros or pounds and go back home. Oh, I love this. This is good, this is good church here, y'all. This is good church here. I was pre can you give yourself a big round of applause for your amazing generosity? <laughs> Come on, somebody. We were able to bless those young ladies with a little over $2,000 in five minutes, in, in like 30 seconds, $2,000 in 30 seconds. And generosity changes lives. Stick with me. So the next week, we got um, a message on social media from one of their mothers, okay? Now, their daughters were stuck in a hurricane coming here to our conference, and she says this, I am the mother of one of the four young girls from the UK that came over from your conference. I've attempted to send a message to Pastor Ken, however, it wouldn't allow me to send it because I block a lot of people. I just wanted to <laughs> message you on behalf of all parents. Listen, we were overwhelmed at the generosity and the care from yourself, Pastor Ken, and your church. Knowing you were keeping in touch with our girls during their stay was such a comfort to us back in the UK. The most mind-blowing thing was the generosity of your church and your offer to fund their return trip next year we are still in shock and blown away. We just want to say a massive thank you, Leslie, and ask to please convey this message to Pastor Ken and the church regard Susan. Can somebody give Jesus praise for that? All right. Here's my point. Generosity changes lives. In our hurricane relief efforts over the last few weeks, as a church, we were able to give $9,000 towards hurricane relief partnering with three organizations in Florida and the Carolinas, Bayside Church, Love Story Church, and Convoy of Hope. Together, we were able to serve 46,241 hot meals, complete 241 community projects, give 5,670 bottles of water, 1,200 non-perishable meals, 600 blankets, 288 stuffed animals, and we deployed a total of 105 volunteers to help with cleanup in Orlando and Sarasota here in Florida. And only heaven knows the impact that we're making as a church. My point is very simple. Generosity changes lives. Please tell your neighbor, generosity changes lives. Are y'all ready for this today? Let's define some things. What is generosity? Write this down. It's a virtue that involves giving good things to others freely and abundantly. It's a virtue that involves giving good things to others freely and abundantly. It's not giving to get. It's not because I'm giving because I want to get a message from someone's mother. It's not that I'm giving because I want to return. Getting a harvest is a part of sowing a seed, okay? It's a law. It goes together. But that cannot be our motive. The reason that we give is because we love God and we love other people. So generosity in its purest form is that I'm giving because I want to give. I'm giving and I don't expect anything back at all. It is a quality of being kind and giving. It's most synonymous with unselfishness. Generosity is not just about giving money, even though money is a part of it. Stick with me. Generosity is about anything you do from yourself to help somebody else. It's about anything that you do from yourself to bring benefit to somebody else. Forgiveness can be an act of generosity. All right? When somebody has wronged you, offended you, and hurt you, you can hold back 
forgiveness. But God has forgiven us of all of our sins. So as an act of generosity, I forgive people because I've been forgiven myself. It is an act of generosity. Serving can be an act of generosity. When you say, I'm going to be faithful over the least. I'm going to be faithful over the little. I am going to do things that bring a benefit to somebody else. I'm going to do things in the private arenas of my life that will help somebody else be promoted and get ahead. That is an act of generosity. Intercession can be an act of generosity. When you go into your prayer closet and you just pray for you and your family, that's one thing. It's a whole other thing when you go into your prayer closet and you pray for Israel and you pray for Ukraine and you pray for your neighbors that they be born again, that can be an act of generosity. Discipleship can be an act of generosity. Think about it for a moment. You're going to open up your home and lead a small group and let all these people come over and step on your white rugs and be in your refrigerator and then you got to clean up after them and then if they got questions, you got to Google it and figure it out, not because you had the question, but because they had the question. That is an act of generosity. When you pray for somebody else, when you're there for somebody else, that is an act of generosity, and we need more generous people that live to give and give to live with the church, please say amen. And sometimes it doesn't have to be some huge thing that you do. What I found is that sometimes the small acts of generosity gets the greatest returns. It makes the biggest results. You know, uh, numerous years ago, I was at an IHOP, and I say a long time ago because I ain't been at an IHOP in a minute, but I was at an IHOP, and my bill came to like $35. But I felt the Holy Spirit tell me to leave a, a large tip. So I had a $100 bill. You know, normally with a $35 meal, I mean, your tip would be $7. I left the lady $100. And I just left the restaurant, and I'm walking outside to the parking lot, walking to my car, and I hear somebody bust out of the doors of AHA. Thank you. Thank you. It was the waitress. She was just so excited because sometimes it's the small things that make the biggest difference, you know? Um, in Hurricane Milton, we knew that it was going to hit like Wednesday night. And so right around 2 or 3 o'clock on Wednesday, it's starting to get dark. The winds are moving. You know, it, it, you could see that the storm was coming in. And I went out to get my family some pizza before the pizza restaurant had shut down. And I saw this homeless couple in my neighborhood. I had been looking for them for a couple of months because I had seen them and we had a conversation before and I was a blessing to them. And I've been dreaming of some ways that even if it's one family at a time, how could we just rehabilitate people completely? So I've been looking for this couple, okay? And I found this couple and they were outside the CVS and they had one of their children in a shopping cart and they were talking to a police officer and this man was fully dressed in his uniform and as I was driving by, I could tell they wasn't in trouble. The police officer was like, what are you all about to do? Do you guys have a place to go? That, that was my imagination. That's what I thought the conversation was happening. So I have a, a choice here. I can just go with my family to my home and eat my pizza or I could go get in somebody else's business and see how I can help. And so I pulled over my car and I jumped out of the car and I walked up and I, I looked at the police officer. I said, is everything okay here? Now he's looking at me like, who in the world? <laughs> he did, he was like, he looked me up and down like, what, who are you? And I was like, do these people not have a place to stay tonight? And they was like, no, you know, we are living in a hotel, but we don't have money for the hotel tonight and we don't have any place to go. And I says, well, I'll pay for it for two nights. This woman said, thank you, Jesus, and start running around the parking lot. Sometimes it's the small things that make the biggest difference. Yes, sir. It was only two nights. It's the small things, you know. Last week I was traveling. There's a church that I oversee in North Carolina, so I wanted to go there and just serve that church on last Sunday. That's why I wasn't with you guys. And, um, you know, m m we had to take a plane. And I had me and my son. He's 13 years old. And, you know, I don't know about you. I hate those rental car shuttles. I wish they'd put the rental cars right near the airport. Why well, I got to take a bus to get a car? I just, I don't like it at all. But anyway, I got on this rental car shuttle, and there was an old older gentleman that was driving, and he had a smile on his face, and he was doing such an excellent job. I mean, he had a spirit of excellence on him. And we tried to get on the bus, and he just took our suitcases, and he put them away. You know how they had those little shelves, and he put them away for us. And getting off the bus, I was like, listen, I'm not, I don't want this older gentleman to carry my bags. I'm 46. I carry my own bags. He's 13. He, you know, he let him carry all the bags. We got it. It's okay. <laughs> But the man was like, no, no, I got it. And he took our bags and he put them out there on the cement so that we didn't have to touch them. And I, I, and I just lost track of my thinking. I started thinking about where's my car and what time do I need to be at this meeting and so forth and so on. But then as I got in my car, I was about to drive out, you know, where you go out and they got the little spikes up. And I said, you know what? I saw his bus and the man was still sitting on the bus like he was about to go pick up more people. And I said, 
I said, um, Kenny, what I want you to do, I got $10 out of my backpack and I gave it to my son. I said, I want you to jump out the car. I want you to go get on the bus and I want you to give it to that man. And I love my son because he didn't even second guess it. He wasn't like, what do you mean? He was like, okay, okay, I'm gone, right? And I saw this 13-year-old boy, and this was like the Matrix. You know how the bus got two doors? He jumped on the back of the bus as the door was closing in slow motion. He jumps on the back of the bus. I'm sitting in the car, and I'm watching him walk up the, the, and I see the bus driver look back like, why are you back on the bus? There's nobody else on the bus. He's looking back at like, why are you on the bus? My son goes, and he gives him $10, and he's like, here you go. This is for you. Thank you for all you do. And the man had this huge Kool-Aid smile all of a sudden, and he got so excited that he opened up the door to the bus, ran off the bus, ran up to my car, and said, thank you, thank you. God bless you. It's the little thing sometimes that makes the biggest difference. God is looking for generous people that live with an open hand and an open heart because generosity, it changes lives whether you know it or not. I want to look at God's word with you today over in Psalms 112, and I want to read a few scriptures together because I believe they're going to strengthen us today. Let's start at Psalms 112 verse 5. If you're ready, shout, I'm ready. Ready, read. It says, good will come to those who are generous and lend freely who conduct their affairs with justice. How many of you all want good to come? How many of you all want good to come your way? Can I prophesy that good is coming your way as we end this year, as we go into next year? I declare over you good things are coming your way in your marriage and in your family and in your finances and your business. How many of you all know it's easy to believe that bad things are coming your way, but I I declare good things are coming your way if you are generous. And that's what it's saying. This is not a suggestion in the Word of God. This is a promise from God that good will come to those who are generous. And God watches over His Word to perform it because He's not a man that should lie or the son of man that needs to repent. It reminds me of Oral Roberts, old school evangelist, tent meeting, one of the first preachers to be on TV and lead millions of people to Jesus. He had a saying and he would say, something good is going to happen for you today. I believe we need to go back home and start saying what some of the old school preachers used to say that had an anointing on their lives. Don't let the mantles of former generations lie in the valley. We need to pick them up again and go home and start saying, there's something good going to happen for me today. Come on, y'all. People talk about Blue Monday and Hump Wednesday. I don't care what day it is, something good about to happen for me today. Because if God be for me, then who can be against me? I love this. Look at Proverbs. Let's go over to Proverbs, chapter number 22. And let's read this one together. Ready, read. It says, he who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. Lead that up. It says, he who has a generous eye will be blessed. Come on, online here. How many of y'all want to be blessed? Two hands if you want to be blessed. If you don't have your hand up, you obviously don't know what the blessing is. The blessing is an empowerment of the Holy Spirit that wants to come on your life for you to get supernatural results. There's a scripture that says in the Old Testament that the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and it addeth no sorrow. I want your marriages blessed. I want your mind blessed. I want your soul blessed. I want your spirit blessed. I believe that God wants to bless us. And it says, he who has a generous eye will be blessed. We need to abort or get rid of the evil eye in exchange for a generous eye. Somebody say amen. Amen. You say, what is a generous eye? I don't know what it is, but what I think that it is is a person that looks for giving opportunities. Too many people look for taking opportunities. There's too many leeches nowadays, people that just want to get, and they want to get, and they want to take, and they want to take. But if you want to be blessed, you want to have a generous eye, for it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Generosity changes lives. It's something about the person that goes out of, the, out of these church walls and goes home and you go into your marriage and you just look to give to your husband or you look to give to your wife. Kids look to give to their parents, give encouragement and give compliments. There's something about the person that looks to give. And then it ends in this, it says, for he gives of his bread to the poor. And so I don't know if you've been following me on social media right now, my heart is breaking even more. And I think it's the Holy Spirit. He's breaking my heart with compassion for those who are homeless and poor. And we are right now positioning our church to see a measurable change in homelessness and poverty in our city. You say, Pastor, how will we do it? I don't know yet, but God's going to give us strategy because I'm asking for it. And I want to be able to say, not that we feed somebody or give them a sandwich or something. I want to say, can we take somebody from not having a home to having a good job loving Jesus? I want to be able to see us fully rehabilitate people. 
So we want you, when you're out and about, give to the poor, look out for the poor. But even if you don't do that, just know that when you give to this church, 10% of what you give, we reinvest in missions, and a portion of that is given to the poor. So when you give to this church, you are giving to the poor, not just locally, but we have people in South Africa, Dominican Republic, India, around the world, we are trying to find places that we can be a blessing to. So thank you for your generosity, for your generosity changes lives. <laughs> Let's go with me over to 2 Corinthians 8 and 7. Got a few more scriptures I want to look at today. Can we read this one together? Ready, read. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace giving. What I believe Paul is saying to the Corinthian church is like, you guys are bad to the bone. You excel in everything. Now, some of y'all, you know how to worship. I mean, you worship, you're on your knees, you're crying, your makeup off. I mean, you're going hard. I mean, you know how to pray. You go home, you got a prayer closet that's all set up. You know how to pray to paint off the wall. I mean, every time there's a missions trip, some of y'all go on missions trips. Some of y'all, we talk about getting on the dream team. Some of y'all in two or three areas of ministry. I'm talking about you feed the hungry. You do everything. You do everything but give. And sometimes we feel justified because we do so much other stuff. We feel like, man, I, I'll lead a small group. I'm on a dream team. I go on a missions trip. I don't need to give. And that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you excel in everything else. Just make sure that you excel in this grace of giving. Many people say, well, you know, Pastor, I, I tithe. I tithe my time. Let, let, let me help you. Let me help you. <laughs> Tithing in the Bible is not a time principle. It is a financial principle. Right, now, you can tithe your time. I think that would be cool. Give God two hours and 40 minutes a day. But when you talk about the tithe, the tithe ain't talking about your time. It's talking about finances. And I want to help somebody today because tithing is not an Old Testament principle. We need to stop that. Tithing is for every believer. It is a, a biblical principle. Jesus told us to tithe in Matthew 23, 23. The writer of Hebrews chapter 7 confirms that here men that die receive tithes, but there Jesus. So when you give your tithe, it's actually worship to Jesus. There is not one scripture where the tithe has stopped. Matter of fact, Abraham paid the tithe to Melchizedek 400 years before the law under grace, symbolically showing us how we should bring a tithe to our high priest that was like Melchizedek. In the New Testament, it would be Jesus, all right? And so when the Bible talks about tithing, it's not talking about your time. It's talking about your finances, your currency. So if you, if you get paid in cattle, it will be 10% of your cattle but most of y'all don't get paid in cattle. If you were in India, it would be in rands, possibly. It'd be 10% of your rands in Europe, 10% of your euros. In, in America, 10% of your dollar-dollar bills, y'all. Right? And what the scripture is saying is that, listen, that's amazing that you know how to pray, and you do this, all these other spiritual things, but don't forget the grace of giving. I don't know about you. I want to excel in that grace as well. Somebody say amen. amen. Proverbs chapter 19, verse number 6 Let's read this one together. Ready, read. It says, many seek the favor of a generous man, and everyone is a friend to a man who gives gifts. And I know that to be true. You know, many seek the favor. So this shows me two things. Write this down. Generosity produces responsibility, and also generosity produces favor. Generosity produces responsibility because many, when you're a generous person, many people are going to seek your favor because they're expecting a handout. When you are a generous person, family, friends, and people are going to come to you, so now you have a responsibility to know when to say yes and know when to say no. A generous person also will always have favor. You know, I got some friends of mine, and <laughs> they are just being promoted everywhere. I'm talking about their books are doing well. Social media, church is crazy growing. Uh, I, saw them on, I saw them on Good Morning America. I mean, this is how well that they're doing. But what people don't know about my friends, they're some of the most generous people that you'll ever meet. They tapped into Proverbs 19.6 because everybody is a friend to the person who gives gifts. Now, I want to help you today because some of you all are about to get let go of your job or you're being passed up for promotion because you don't know how to give gifts. I dare you to go to work and buy lunch for people and watch how you get promoted. 
I dare you to go to work and start buying donuts for people and watch how you get promoted. Everybody's a friend to the person who buy gifts. Nobody's saying amen. <laughs> how many of you all know of a gift giver in your life and you love to see him coming? They're going to pay for dinner. They're going to pay for lunch. They're going to let you get two desserts. I'm talking about how many of y'all know of a gift giver and you like, they got it, right? Right? Everybody loves that person. How many of you all got any leeches in your life and you hate to see them coming because they're going to suck you dry? My God. Come on, tell the truth in the church today. Come on online. Anybody here got some leeches? And to cut them leeches off. Right? Well, what the scripture is saying is that everyone is a friend to a man who gives good gifts. What would happen if you start be, being a, a gift giver? I'm telling you, promotion would not be passing you by. You would have new levels of opportunity, new levels of promotion, because everybody would want to be your friend. Nobody saying amen, but I don't care. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. And uh, this will be our last one in this section here. Can we read this one together? Ready, read. It says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives richly all things to enjoy. So God doesn't mind us enjoying our life with the church say amen. It says, let them do good that they may be rich in good works, that they may be ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may take hold of eternal life. Now, <clears throat> notice what 1 Timothy doesn't say. It doesn't say for rich people don't be rich. It says, use your richness to be a blessing to somebody else. It does not say for rich people, because the problem is not you having money. The problem is when money has you. And money can be a hand in the tool of the believer where we can build what is in the heart of God and be the hands and feet of Jesus in a tangible way. See, many people, you know, they pray and they do spiritual things. There are tangible things that we need to do in conjunction with spiritual things. So the Bible gives us these four things to do. It says do good, be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. For those of you all who don't consider yourself rich, if you happen to live in America, you probably make more money than 95% of the world. So you are a rich person. This scripture is for you. And it tells us what to do. And then verse 19 says, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may ha lay hold of eternal life. So... The problem that we have is that sometimes when God has been good to us, what we do is we buy more clothes, more cars, we go on better vacations so that we can brag to our friends and take pictures about where we've been. And that's okay, but let me give you a higher way. That's temporal. So there are some things that you will not be able to take into eternity with you. You will not be able to take your 401k, your investment portfolio, your homes, your cars, your watches, or anything else. And so what verse 19 does is it shifts our focus from things that we can't take to heaven to eternal things. And it says that you can lay up for yourself things in eternity. So when you use your natural resources to win souls into the kingdom, and because you're a giver, people come out of darkness into light, that is a reward that's on its way that is not temporal, but it's eternal. And when you get to heaven, angels are going to be applauding you because you was trustworthy with mammon. Are you here with me today? So what stops us from being generous? I believe, number one, we don't want to be taken advantage of. And that is understandable, but we got to be careful that our desire not to be taken advantage of doesn't have us walk by fear. Because the Bible says that we have not been given the spirit of fear. So we're called to walk by faith, not by fear. And so, and truthfully, there are some things that God asks you to do that you won't have a safety net for. There's no plan B in faith. God said it, I believe it, that settles it, I'm going to do it. And I learned this principle years ago, and it's helped me to be a free giver. That when God asks me to give something, my responsibility is to obey him. That's it. Meaning that if that church, that organization, or that person wants to do wrong things with the money, they have to stand before Jesus of what they did. I have to stand before Jesus based upon did I give what God told me to give. Some of us have our intellect too much in to what people are doing with the money. Instead of saying, God, what have you asked me to do? I'm going to let you be God over me and also God over... Now, this freaked me up. I don't know about you. This freed me up. 
Because there's a scripture, there's a principle that says that when you sow a seed, the seed first has to die. And sometimes when people give big, they like to control things. Well, if we don't do this, if we start another service, another campus, I'm not going to give any longer. That means you haven't let your seed die because you're trying to use it to manipulate the process. And so when you are a generous person, you give and you don't know what's going to happen with it, but you trust God because you gave it to him anyway. This has helped me over the years. I'm hoping that it's helping you. So when it comes to the homeless, I learned... Somebody taught me this years ago. I don't even know where I got it from. They said, don't give to those who are homeless because they might use it to buy more substance or have substance abuse. And so what you should do is just go buy them some food and stuff like that, but don't give them money. And so there were years of my life where I would see someone who was struggling and I would try to run to the 7-Eleven and buy a bunch of bags of chips and donuts and stuff and run to the restaurant because I didn't want to give them money. And then it dawned on me that it's not my job to police what they do with the money. It's my job to police what I do with what God's given me. (laughs) So now, when I pull up to a stop sign or a a red light and someone has a sign, all I do is say, Holy Spirit, is this the one? 90% of the time, the Lord said, (laughs) yep. So I carry money in my glove box just so that I can be a blessing to people because 90% of the time, and watch this, I don't know what they're going to do with the money. I don't know what they're going to buy with the money, but that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to obey what God has told me. Am I helping anybody today? I- I'm just here to help. My name is Ken and I'm your friend. Number two, why aren't people more generous? Because we gave too much of ourselves before and we don't want to be pinched again. How many of you all have ever been in a relationship that you gave too much of yourself before? Part of a church where you gave too much of yourself, so you said. Part of a charitable organization. But here's what I need you to hear today. Don't let what you experience change who you are. Because if you are a giver, you will not be fulfilled if you're not giving. For me, I don't have a problem with giving too little. I got a problem with giving too much. And I'm raising up a culture of people here Our problem is not that we give too little. It's like, where do I put the brakes on? But this is what I've made up my mind to do. If I'm ever going to err, whether it's going to be give too less or give too much, I would rather err on the side of giving too much. Because what I found out is that you can't outbeat God in giving no matter how hard you try. I think there's too many people when you get to heaven, all right, I want to get to heaven, and if I'm going to hear a rebuke, I want Jesus to say, you gave too much. You didn't have to do all of that. Did not ask you to do it, but you still gave it. I don't want to hear him say, look at all the things that I gave you, but you kept too much. You stingy little sucker, you. I gave my life on a cross for you, and you held on to everything and bought you new shoes and went on a cruise and had a membership to Planet Fitness. Look at you. I guess I'm going to let you in. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear, come on in, thou good and thou faithful servant. You've been faithful over little things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Are y'all with me today? Why don't people give? Number three, we feel overwhelmed and overworked. And we feel like we just don't have anything to give. I can't give it if I don't have it. And that's, that's true. Let's talk about it. 2 Corinthians 8, 12, it says, for if the willingness is there, The gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. So when it comes to giving, you don't have to ever feel guilt or condemnation to give something that you don't have. You cannot ever give what you don't have. (laughs) What is that old saying? You can't squeeze blood out of a turnip. I don't know if blood's come out of turnips. I don't know. But what it means is that you can't give what you don't have. If you do not have any time, you can't give what you don't have. If you don't have the talent, Like, you can't sing, you can't get up on the worship team. We don't want to hear that. And if you don't have a job right now, you can't give. You have no income. The problem is not that people, you know, don't have a job. The problem is that people have a job, but you just overconsume and are in debt with the wrong things. I believe the word of the Lord for many of us this year as we go into 2025 is margin. Everybody say margin. I believe that God is asking for you online to have margin. Everybody shout margin. I'm telling you, if you can get this word in your spirit, you just need to create margin. People say, well, I don't have time to serve. You're too busy. You are too busy with good things that ain't God things. You got to look at your calendar and you got to cut out some things. You got your kids and all these activities, but do they hear from the voice of God? Are they in the house of God? And listen, good can be the 
enemy of God things. Good things can. So we got to create margin in our calendar so that we can answer the call of God when he asks for us to serve and do something. Y'all ain't saying nothing in this church and I don't care. We got to create margin in our budget. Many of us are over-consumed and we're living off debt and we say we can't afford to give. That's not true. You got a job. You can't afford, but God's not first. You got your hair done, your nails done, you go to Starbucks every day. Come on, somebody, you got your kids in private school and the government pay for half of it, but you say, I can't afford to give. That's not true. You can't afford to give. So when God asks you to give, we're not trying to move you into guilt. We just want you to reprioritize your life and create some margin. Hallelujah. I don't know if they like me, Josh. It's okay. We live in a day and time where we are overconsumed. You know, Visa, MasterCard, and American Express, they never lay off people. I've never seen them needing a government bailout. They're doing well. You ever notice that? In every commercial, American Express commercial, is people living the life, swiping. I mean, they out at the social hour swiping. They're over in Dubai swiping, right? And it sends a message to our society that you need something you can't afford. And we have to, as believers, learn to be content because I would rather obey God than buy new clothes. I would rather obey God than get a new car. I would rather obey God than go on a vacation because I know that when I do, I'll go on better vacations and the presence of God will be with me. Are you with me today? We need margin. Somebody shout margin. We need margin. Here's your assignment. Can you do this? Go home and look at your budget and start just to cut stuff out. Just start to cut stuff out because you don't need that new phone. You really don't. Your, old, your I-12 is fine. I know it ain't got the push button and all that stuff, but you don't really need all that. It's amazing. Your old laptop, it's okay. And listen, we need to start thrifting a little bit more. You know, you, you, listen, when I was in tons of debt, you know, I haven't had a credit card in over 15 years. And so my financial advisor, he told me recently, he said, well, you need to get a business credit card because then you'll get the rewards and you'll get some free plane trips and stuff. And I, met, I, I said, I don't know about that but then I found out it was true. Because <laughs> what you can do is you can pay your balance off every month and then you won't have the interest, but you get the perks, okay? So I got a credit, I got an American Express for the first time in 15 years. It's a business one, it's not a personal one, I still won't do that. And man, that thing came to my house and I saw it and it was, it was like, like, it was heavy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I should show you this American, the thing was heavy. It was like a piece of gold. Like, you feel good giving it to people like that. <laughs> Got that platinum, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll take two coffees, two lattes, hope. Soy milk, please. You know what I'm saying? You feel like you're somebody, right? Man, and I'm looking at this thing, and uh, that American Express came in, and it just sat on my desk for three months. I couldn't bring myself to use it for three months. I just looked at it because I knew how much debt I used to have and how far God had brought me from. You're going to have to put your foot in the sand. And you got to come to the place like, if I, if I can't afford it, I don't need it. And I'm content enough to get what God wants me to have when he wants me to have it. I'm preaching better than they saying, amen, Jesus. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and so here we go, y'all. How do we become more generous? I got to move on. Oh, I ain't got much time. Number one, you need an open heart and an open hand. All right? An open heart and an open hand, what's that? Love. The reason that we give is not because we're going to get. Getting is a part of it, harvest is a part of it, but you don't have to, you, your motive should be, I love God and I love people. Amen. Number two, stewardship over ownership. This will free somebody up to be generous. If you realize, like I realize, that I don't own anything. My house is not my house, my car is not my car, these clothes are not my clothes. <laughs> I am a manager on the behalf of a kingdom that you cannot see right now. I am a steward, not an owner. You know when people trip out with giving 10% to God? Because they say, that's my money. You crazy. Uh, it's not 10% that's God's money. 100% belongs to God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So he gives you 90% to manage as a steward. How dare you keep the 10%? when 100% belongs to him. Those kids are not your kids. 
They're God's kids. You're, you're managing them. So when you understand that you are a steward, not an owner, you give freely because it ain't mine no way. I got to move on. Number three is that you would look for giving opportunities. So if you want to be a generous person, you will look for opportunities to give. And I wanted to tell you today about a giving opportunity that is coming up in six weeks. And my hope is that as a church, we will prepare with all of our heart for this opportunity to give. You know, at the end of the year, on December the 8th, bring that up, everybody write this down, December the 8th is coming up in six weeks. We have a year-end giving opportunity that we call Super Sunday. Super Sunday is our heart of the house offering. It is our kingdom expansion offering. 100% um, of what we receive that day enables us to reach more lives, save more souls on next year than we did on this year. It is strategically placed in December because we believe that Jesus is the reason for the season. All we ask our church to do is pray and say, Lord, what would you have me to give? And all we ask you to do is to do whatever God asks you to do. We put this in December because we know that Jesus is the reason for the season. The Christmas holiday is crazy consumerism. I mean, people are trying to sell you all kinds of things. And we said as a church, before we buy a gift for somebody that can't save us, heal us, or deliver us, we're going to bring our first and our best gift to Jesus, for he is the reason for this season. We end our year in faith. Some of you all have had a tough year and you're tempted to be in doubt and worry and unbelief. Don't end your year that way. End your year believing that next year is going to be the best year of your life. I don't know about you, but when I come next year and I begin to give you vision for next year, this is going to be our best year ever if it's our best year spiritually. Does anybody believe that today? Yes. This year, we saw 6,969 souls get saved in our church. 6,900. Next year, we believe in for 20,000 people. Amen. And we just believe there's an anointing here for that. So for Super Sunday, this is going to be me and Tabitha's 24th consecutive year giving in these moments. People say, why are you guys so blessed? I don't know. God's good. Um, but I, I do know this, is that we're, we try to be as generous as we can. Even when I was in business, I would plan all year for this year-end offering, meaning that I'm going to come with something that's a sacrifice. I'm going to come with something that takes faith. And so starting on next week, you'll see a little bit of uh, signage in the lobby. It will say, pray, prepare, participate. All we ask you to do is pray and say, Lord, what would you have me to give? And if he speaks to you, then we ask you to prepare like David did in 1 Chronicles 29 with all of your heart and might. Me, I have to liquidate an asset to give what he's asking me to give. I got to do some things, but I'm going to be ready. And then we ask for you to participate. Are y'all here with me today? Yes. Super Sunday is probably the best Sunday of our year, honestly speaking. Um, it is the one Sunday where there is such a tangible presence of God because many times we come to church to get a word, to get prayer. This is the one church time a year where thousands of people will come together and sacrifice and say, God, we love you, and we honor you, and we trust you, and the presence of God shows up. You will see grandparents with parents and grandchildren come to the altar as families giving. And so we want you to get a, a word for the year. I don't know how you end your year, and so I'm going to give you the word for our house next Sunday, but get a word from God. What are you believing for in 2025? And I want you to come and just believe God as you sow. You can't buy a blessing, but you can sow a seed in a, in a target, in a direction and say, God, I'm believing you for a harvest in this area. Matter of fact, let's do that. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Can we just take a moment? And can you do this under, under, there's an anointing in this place and online. And just ask the Lord, say, Lord, what would you have me to give in Super Sunday? What would you have me to give? Now, sometimes when the Lord speaks, he speaks audibly sometimes, but most of the time it's an impression. There's just something that kind of runs across your mind I would investigate that. Some of you all he will speak to today. Some of you all he will speak to as you continue to seek him over the next six weeks. Some of you all he will wait until Super Sunday and speak to you directly then, but you want to try to get a word now. And even for those of you all who are online, if you say, Pastor Ken, when is a good time to come and visit in Orlando? I would say there's two seasons that stick out to me 
it would be Super Sunday and a live conference. Super Sunday, there's just something about putting your feet on the soil when there's such a transaction of faith and sacrifice. But a live conference as well, it's just, those would be two great times. And so if you want to give online, you can start to prepare yourself as well because this is going to be for our entire community as God releases and activates an anointing for generosity. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give you an opportunity to get saved today. I don't believe that you came to church to leave the same way that you've came. I believe you came here because God loves you. And some of you all, you need Jesus in your life. Jesus paid the price for all of our sins so that we don't have to pay for it ourselves. And if you're here today and you can be humble enough to admit that you've sinned, the Bible says that we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And so we all are in need of a Savior, and His name is Jesus. And there is no name like the power that is in His name. And if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I want to be at peace with God. I want a relationship with God. I want to be forgiven of my sins on the count of three. I'm going to ask you to boldly lift up your hand. And the reason that you can be saved today is because of the generosity of God. God the Father gave His only begotten Son, Jesus, so that He could have a harvest of sons and daughters. Now, as an act of generosity, you can give your heart back to Jesus. And so if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I want to be saved today. I want to be right with God. On the count of three, I want you to boldly lift up your hand and wave at me so that I can know who I'm praying for today all over the building and online. One, two, three. Just lift up your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to be saved today. Thank you. I see your hand and your hand and your hand and your hand and your hand. Your hand and your hand and your hand and your hand and your hand. Your hand and your hand and your hand and your hand and your hand. Your hand and your hand, your hand, your hand, your hand. Your hand, your hand, your hand. Your hand, your hand, your hand, your hand. And hands are going up, I'm sure, online. You can put your hands down. Nobody prays alone. The Bible says when you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. And so let's call on his name together. Come on, church, let's pray. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sin. From this day forward, I give you all of me for all of you. I believe you died on a cross just for me. Jesus, be the Lord of my life, the Savior of my soul. Fill me with your spirit and power so that I can live for you all the days of my life. For I am saved right here, right now, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, church, amen. Woo! If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. If you want to get involved in our church, you want this to be your church home, your next step would be growth track. Everybody say growth track. growth track. Growth track begins 10 minutes after every service. You can leave your kids in kids' church, grab a coffee, meet us in growth track. If you can give us two weeks, we'll help you get connected, discover your purpose, and also make a difference. That's the way to get involved, all right? I want to pray. I want to activate generosity very quickly. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, this message is for me, I have not been as generous as I should be but I want to begin. Could you stand? All over the building. If that's you, I want to pray for you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your generosity. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I've been generous, but I'm ready to go to a whole nother level of generosity. Could you stand? All over the building. If that's you. You guys are what I can call the doers of the word, and I want to prophesy over you very quickly. Could you just, could you just put your hands like this to receive from the Lord? Father, in the name of Jesus, we declare that the gift of giving that's been lying dormant in them be turned on right now. We give you praise that that which was turned off is activated right now. We pray that from this day forward, they look for giving opportunities, for they have a giving eye, for you said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And I prophesy that you multiply their seed sown and increase the fruits of their righteousness. I thank you that you give seed to the sower new promotions, new jobs, better in their investments so they can be in a position to give back to you and to build what's in your heart. I give you the praise for it, and we call you activated right now. In Jesus' name, would somebody shout hallelujah and give God praise. 
Come on, sir.